3. Let's get to know this watch and see if it's a hit or miss in another free and independent review. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. And as you can see, I'm not in Philadelphia, I'm actually in Washington, DC. I've come here to work on a project for a few days, uh, my work outside of YouTube, but I thought what a perfect opportunity to uh, take this on the road, or the train tracks as it were, because that's how I got here. <laughs> but yeah, this is the Laurier Falcon 3, the third generation. Of course, I had to review it and they've given me the opportunity, so I'm very, very um, thankful uh, to them for allowing me to review it before anybody else. So hopefully, it might even be for sale by the time you see this uh, review. So really cool stuff. Laurier is a brand that changed my whole perception on micro brands. I proudly owned their very first Neptune Diver that they burst onto the watch scene with back in 2018. Now that watch is in its fourth series, and this is something to make note of. Despite being such a young brand in the whole scheme of things, with short runs of each generation, Laurier are always refining and improving their collections. This punctilious approach not only makes each batch somewhat unique, but highly collectible too. My days of owning the Neptune ended when I had the honour and pleasure of collaborating with them in 2021. That was with the now legendary Safari in two 36mm variations. This was the result of three years of several failed prototypes with a painstaking major redesign, which I have to credit Lorenzo for the spark of genius behind it, which at one point we almost gave up on. As many of you know, I have designed for many watchmakers over the years, both publicly and now some privately, for obvious reasons. Who knows, you might even be wearing a watch I designed and not know it. But I have to say working with Laurier, or more specifically the dynamic duo husband and wife team behind the brand, Lorenzo and Lauren Ortega, was by far one of the most educational and interesting experiences. What makes Laurier different to other brands is their meticulous process, patience, persistence, respect for the classics, and true understanding in what defines a strong design. Um, but yeah, I'm exploring, thank you very much. So a visit to Washington DC could not be complete without coming to the Exorcist steps here. Personally, my favorite is, is Exorcist 3. Let me know your favorite in the comments below. Kind of scared to go up these, I don't want to break my neck. I'm wearing the Explorer because I'm getting reacquainted with it. Uh, not that I need to, but as I'm analyzing the Falcon 3, I'm exploring with the Explorer. Laurier, like any successful brand, has a style that is distinctly their own. Hallmarks and signature elements that carry across each and every collection, instantly identifying the watches as theirs, even if you took the name off the dial. They say a good character in a movie or graphic novel can be characterized by simple outline or shape, and you should be able to instantly recognize them from a simple silhouette. Batman, with his spiked ears, for example, the Predator with his dreadlocks and armor, or James Bond and that gun with the crossed arm stance. I think in many ways the same applies to watches, or at least well-designed ones. Laurier is built upon the classicism of predominantly, not always, but predominantly 1950s and 1960s design, something we both share an admiration for, as these decades were unquestionably the most formative, influential and historically important when it comes to traditional mechanical watches and the creation of more iconic watches than any other decade, most of which we still are inspired by or lusting after today. I'm here for three days and I tend to swap out watches several times a day, so in theory it should be 
uh, nine. But, <laughs> but actually, this is a really cool little collection in itself, a kind of espionage, spy, Bondian theme to it. You'll see why in a moment. Of course, I brought my Pepsi GMT, the Pussy Galore watch as well. Well, not this particular model, the older one was. Uh, I never travel without it. It's my de facto travel watch, that second time zone, coordinating Zoom calls to Switzerland for business, family in Italy and the UK, immensely useful. Uh, the Submariner, I wore this this morning and yesterday, jogged past the uh, the White House wearing this. It's on the regimental strap. This is actually from the very first Laurier I owned. Then my backup watch for everything, really, the Mission Impossible. So a little bit off on a tangent, not strictly Bondian, but yeah, the alarm, all the functions, extremely, extremely, extremely functional and yeah, backup if the, if the phone dies. Then I borrowed this from Moya Fine Jewelers. This is the Seamaster. This happens to be the very first, well, not this particular watch, but this model was the very first Seamaster I ever owned. This is a later Brosnan era, the same model given to Prince William by the late great Princess Diana. So this is very much evoking a, a, a Proustian Madeleine moment. Uh, that's very pre pretentious, but anyway, uh, that's the truth. Everything about it, oh my God, I might do a video and, you know, showing my reaction, but I brought it because my last watch, well, obviously I got the Laurier, but the last watch here is my 36 millimeter Explorer. I wanted these two 36 millimeter watches with me to kind of compare to the Laurier and really understand this size and scale and how different watches do 36 millimeter. And therefore you, you kind of can get a better sense of the minutiae of the design and everything like that. Uh, naturally, a whole bunch of straps, uh, mainly, here we got, mainly Wrist Candy Watch Club, the Malone straps, depending on my outfit, I should have worn the NDC for jogging this morning. They're all water resistant. And of course, my Valor, which I co-designed, the SOE. I really quite like the olive with the red. I might change them out in a moment. But the case is an NDC with the soft interior, which is really handy for polishing, not polishing the watch, but just cleaning it when it gets a bit grubby. So four in here and then one in the little suede pouch that uh, comes with the Laurier watch. I'll put that in my pocket, a bit like my Unico. And then obviously one watch on me. A quick addendum. Now, if you saw my uh, top 10 travel essentials video, you'll remember that a lot of you were commenting, oh, you should include a USB charger. And you're absolutely right. But I neglected to mention that, that Carl Friedrich, the maker of my wonderful backpack here, the carry-on case you'll see me using in this video actually has a built-in USB charging station in the suitcase. Extremely useful. So a shout out to Carl Friedrich. I highly recommend it. Also, it can take the knock super extremely well built. It's like a tank. Almost a, a slight Bondian gadgetry angle <laughs> to, the, to the suitcase. Now which watch should I wear? Mm, decisions, decisions. Another aspect that enabled Laurier to stand head and shoulders above the competition was always being tastefully elegant, refreshingly modest in size, with a clean but functional aesthetic all the while never being too much of any particular historic reference. The Neptune was a bewitching love letter to many archetypal divers we all love and desire, from the likes of Amiga, Blancpain and Rolex, without ever being just a straight up homage of any one particular model. It felt like its own thing while still evoking the look and feel of the divers that very much defined the genre. This is an extremely difficult thing to do, and this is why you can begin to understand our beloved safari took three years to get right. We are on the rooftop with a little infinity pool, having very, very good sushi. That building there is the Watergate Hotel. That's where it all happened. Apparently they got a rooftop uh, bar that's pretty good. So here we have the third generation of Falcon, with some interesting updates over its now discontinued predecessors. The Falcon was initially inspired by three important tool turned field and sports watches. The first was the Amiga Railmaster of the massively important 1957 trilogy that changed the brand forever. Then we have the first Alpinist from 1959 and a very early 1950s Rolex Explorer 6350. Immediately you will notice the lack of date in that true tool watch ideology of no date, three hand simplicity. 
The less complicated the watch, the less variables that could possibly go wrong. So if it went all a bit peat tong halfway up Everest or on whatever remote expedition, the consequences could be very serious without a reliable time-telling device. In an age before quartz and digital tech, we have to remember lives depended on this form of technology. These three undeniable classics were all originally intended to tell time in challenging conditions with maximum legibility. This third gen improves on this by going with the Explorer-style numeral layout in a thickly three-dimensional printed BGW9 Superluminova over the Alpinist-esque triangles of Gen 1 and 2. And this ultimately improves orientation at a quick glance drastically. This is essentially why the Explorer dial has become just so beloved and permeated into so many other watch designs, far beyond Rolex. It's so far away now, it's closer if we go around the back. Do you want to walk? Should we walk around the back? Should we try and, try and sneak in the back, right? So I've got a very historic wristwatch check. <laughs> Definitely a different type of video today, but yeah, pretty cool that we could get this close. On the front, there's whole kinds of barricades and stuff. I kind of prefer this view. I can't wait to post this on the Instagram. This is going to be really fun. So uh, quite a historic Laurier moment, I think. Also improved is the new all brushed Turnion bracelet with softened edges for increased comfort outstanding easy to change thinner screwed links solid end links along with a double push button clasp featuring a nifty three micro adjustment slots the broad arrow hand seems to have grown as well further enhancing its instant differentiation and ease to read the minutes from hours another change is the repositioned lug holes that make it more wearable than ever before in a true tool watch fashion and makes this monochromatic certified strap monster super convenient to swap out. However, I must confess here, I tend to keep Laurier watches on the bracelet most of the time. And that's a good thing because as you guys know, I'm a bit of a diehard NATO strap fan. So I didn't even have a chance to swap it out to my wrist candy watch club straps, but I'll try and include some footage so you can see what it looks like. Beautiful. One of the oldest time-telling devices ever created. Obviously that's a lot newer, but uh, to be honest, I'm just in a little, little bit in awe, really. Così grande! <laughs> Grandissimo! Facciamo un paio di fotografie. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to come back. There's so many museums I wanna, I wanna see as well. From what I understand, the Falcon always had what's called a honeycomb dial. Kind of diamond-shaped small indentations, very similar to a waffle pan. These ultimately give the surface of the dial a unique texture which unequivocally comes alive in different lighting. In previous generations we saw the use of polar whites, midnight blues and black with gilt printing. However this time is the first time we see the iconic Explorer numeral layout with matte silver printing. At first glance, to me at least, I automatically think Rolex 1016, the watch of choice for James Bond creator and former World War II Naval Intelligence Lieutenant Commander Ian Fleming. In many videos I actually stated that it was in fact the real Bond watch, but check those videos out as there's a lot to unpack and discuss there. Some of the earliest explorers, and the rarest of all in fact, did have honeycomb dials, the 6350 in particular. And speaking of military, a quick observation. Never has the sergeant-like insignia of the Laurier logo been so fitting to their watches because of this espionage connection. As is the case with the very first watch Laurier ever did, this is just as much its own thing as it is a tribute to some of the most revered and highly desired classics. The addition of the signature broad arrow handset, oversized screw down crown, angular tipped lugs and wide high polished beveling that follows the whole elegant arching sides of the case are all very much Laurier design traits. In my opinion, this is one of the keys to success behind Laurier compared to let's say my recent and highly controversial review of the contentious Dan Henry 1975. 
Simply put, there's much less here to upset the delicate sensibilities of the watch snobs, and it goes a long way in explaining why Laurier are at the top of this game. <laughs> Don't fall over. I was going to say one of my favourite scenes is in Nixon when he comes up here and he meets the protesters and all of that. It's a bit surreal being here now in person. So many people. What do you expect? Again inside we see the 90S5, a no-date variant of Mayota's 9 series premium automatics. The watch media loves to put words like venerable and workhorse in the same sentence when talking about this higher 28,800 VPH movement. And I struggle to disagree with those cliches. It's a great choice, especially with its slender overall architecture, which as a result enables the watch to have a thinner profile, along with its manual wind hacking 42-hour power reserve features. While Miyota claims the accuracy is minus 10 to plus 30 seconds a day out of the factory, everyone knows with a little bit of regulation you can easily get this running as good as any COSC certified watch. In fact, mine was almost that. Affordable and easy to service, it's no wonder that it's become the backbone of the microbrand watch world. And of course, in a nicely timed segue, this leads on to one of the few negatives of this watch. So, day three uh, here in Washington DC, wearing the Pepsi, changed the watches yet again. Uh, let's talk about negatives. Well, first of all, the Hesalite crystal. A lot of people complain, think it's a shortcut, you know, to save costs. It's not. It's really for that vintage charm, the vintage distortions that Sapphire simply does not do. And that's why they provide PolyWatch. I like it. I, it's very easy to clean off the scratches and they're sticking to their guns. It's, a, it's across the board on all of their watches. Secondly, that bi-directional rotor of the Miyota, you know I'm gonna bring it up. It's part and parcel, unfortunately, of that movement series. Uh, it just has this kind of loud wobble to it. Personally, I don't mind it. it. Reminds you that it's actually working and some people like that. Other than that, I'm struggling to think of any more negatives. So watch spotting in Washington DC, I have to say, I've seen more watches here in three days than I have a year in Philadelphia, well, three years in Philadelphia. A lot, predominantly Seamasters, uh, Amiga Seamasters, the Bond Brosnan era, Dressy Pateks with the suited and booted guys, I presume politicians, a lot of GMTs, Pepsis, interestingly enough. Vintage ones, new ones, they love the Pepsi. I guess it's the American flag colors, who knows? If I were a watch dealer, not that I ever would want to become one, but if I were, I think I'd come to Washington, uh, D.C. Oh, and uh, quite a few um, Breitling Super Oceans as well. In conclusion, the Falcon 3, I feel, is the most all-round cohesive offering from the brand yet. While not as divisive as the Safari was with its thermally blued hands and daring salmon dial version, it's also not as industry leading as when they first stepped onto the scene with the 39mm Neptune Diver back in 2018. These days the rest of the watch world has caught up and is jumping on the mid-century scale bandwagon. Smaller watches are indeed in vogue again, thank the horological gods for that. However, it has to be said, quality, feel and finish is just as impeccable as always. Certainly comfier than both the Omega Brosnan era 36mm Seamaster and just as versatile as my Rolex Explorer, which in my opinion is still the ultimate do-it-all any attire watch. Laurier was not just doing this to be on trend, they were doing it because they wanted to make watches that they wanted to wear themselves. And at the end of the day, that is the main reason why microbrands always seem to offer something more inherently full of passion, with a bit more pizzazz and personal feeling, compared to the corporate or committee-made watches produced by the heavyweight major league heritage brands. Laurier traditionally have always named their watches after thematically fitting gods or figures in classical Greco slash Roman mythology, a reflection of the aesthetic classicism of the watches themselves. Maybe I'm reading a bit too much into that, but anyway, the Falcon breaks that tradition. Although it is one of the fastest birds of prey to ever exist and was a powerful and reoccurring symbol in ancient mythology. It may even be a reference to the minor goddess of magic, Circe, 
who was often represented by the falcon and would turn her enemies into animals through the use of magical potions. Well, in that regard, the watch does bring a magical transformation, to me at least, and evokes the Bondian Ian Fleming 1016 Explorer vibes far more than my modern Rolex has ever done. Not bad for under $500. A pure class capolavoro. That was the watch, but what about the place? I absolutely adored DC, the astonishing amount of museums, art galleries, great restaurants, and historic places to visit would take more than an entire lifetime to experience. And I certainly will be going back there many more times in the future. So not only do I recommend this watch, but also a visit to Washington, D.C. All right, guys, I'm going to leave it there. I've bid you farewell from Washington, D.C. I've loved my stay here. Also, I've loved the Falcon 3, obviously. Let me know your thoughts in the comments uh, below, what you think they got right, what you'd like to see from Laurier in the future. Uh, oh, and don't forget to like this video. Very important indeed, especially if you want to support and see more independent content like this. It's the best way to support the channel. Oh, and share the video, obviously. Uh, right. Onwards and upwards, thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Ciao.